Hutchinson School List, I opened my practice, Mount Tabor Veterinary Care, five and a half years ago <laughs> with Daniela. Daniela was my first receptionist. She was a goddess at the desk. It was amazing. Um, started with three people. We're now up to 16. So it's a little crazy. It's great. I love it. It is my passion. Not only veterinary medicine and being a practitioner, but also now growing my people. It's really been an exciting adventure. So thanks for having me. Um, Danielle asked me to come in to speak, which I'm so excited about your talks. It's just such a great idea to bring so many different animal-minded people together. Um, we have so many different ideas, like Daniela said, so many different passions, and it's just so nice to kind of be in the same room together and have the <coughs> opportunity to learn together and also to have a discussion. So when Daniela asked me, I thought, all right, well, I love controversy. <laughs> controversy is like my very favorite thing to work in. Conflict, but it's not my own conflict. It is really fantastic. And so I'm like, well, what kind of learning better name is? vaccine and they're not so controversial, right? You guys have a lot of ideas about those. So I thought, which could be controversial, actually. Um, so we'll go there. But what I am, what I did think about was heartworm disease in our area and heartworm prevention more specifically because not everybody is on the same page on this. And so I thought it would be really fun to kind of talk and talk from my perspective as well as kind of get your perspective and questions as well. So my first question for you is how many of you have dog or dogs? Wow, lots of dog lovers. And I'm not totally excluding cats, but we're just going to focus on dogs because they're easier. Um, and how many of you have your dogs on a monthly hot room preventative? Wow, that is amazing. So it's good. I'm glad we're having this conversation. So, one of the things that I was thinking about this talk and heartworm disease and heartworm prevention, I come from the University of Illinois. That's where I went to vet school, and I was there for my total of eight years, my undergrad and my vet school. And we had heartworm disease like crazy. When I was a technician, um, not a certified tech, just a, a volunteer technician, I was put in charge of heartworm testing. Now that was before we had the great send out the test or the little snap test. No, this was the ugly down and dirty formalin, putting it in the centrifuge, adding the dye, spinning it down. I could only do like 10 at a time. And I'm in this giant laboratory in the basement of this clinic where I had to walk down the stairs where the crematory was right in front of me, which I had nightmares about. And then run around the corner and go to the lab. And then I would just sit down there. And this, they put me in charge of these heartworm tests. And I thought, Lordy, I don't know what heartworm looks like on a slide. I have to diagnose these cases. And what if I miss one? So I sat there and I would find a little piece of lint. If any of you have ever done any microscope work, suddenly everything looks really important. And I'm like, blue piece of thread. I don't know. <laughs> Is that it? So I run upstairs past the scary crematory upstairs trying to find a doctor. Um, hi, could you, could you come look? I think, I think I might have found one. I had never found one at that point. And they come all the way down the stairs in between appointments, which I feel for them now. They were so nice. Came down and they're like, Kristen, that's a thread. <laughs> you will know when you find heartworm disease, you will know it's like this great ball from you know, the great on high. You will know. So I said, okay, I'll know, I'll know. Okay, I think this is it. So I run upstairs and you know, this is like days later. Kristen, no, I think that's another thread. <laughs> okay, and then one day comes and I put it on the microscope and I'm like, Lordy, heartworm disease. It's everywhere, blue threads all over the place. And then they taught me this cool trick where you could take the, the blood, the fresh blood, and you drop it on a slide and you put a little cover slip on. You can't see the worms, the microfilaria at this point. But you put it on a slide, you put it in, and they just wiggle around. And so all the red blood cells are wiggling around where they're all wiggly, and it was really exciting. So that was my double check. If I thought I was seeing worms or threads, I would check them. Then the drop of I went and got all excited. So I diagnosed that summer about 35 to 40 cases of heartworm in a eight-week period. 
So it was crazy, really crazy. And this is where they're pushing heartworm prevention in one little clinic in that little snapshot of time. So it was kind of scary, you know, I saw them. And the other really interesting story I wanted to share with you, which is why I thought heartworm, besides that really wonderful spiritual journey of <laughs> diagnosing heartworm disease, the other thing that I really wanted to talk about was there was this dog. Don't we all have a story that starts there with this dog? You know, if you work with rescuing animals, there is at least one that has stuck with you. Maybe a hundred. But for this, for me, it's Gus. And I was a junior in vet school, and these poor animals, the juniors are let loose upon them. They come in from the shelter, and we got Gus. And he was this big, dopey, skinny little creature. And he, he was a pointer mix. I believe big floppy ears, white with big brown patches all over him. And we loved Gus. And Gus came in and we we're trying to drop blood on him, you know, because we're vet students. We're not tech students. We don't know how to draw blood. <laughs> we're trying. You know, luckily we usually had one technician in the class or a couple technicians, previous technicians that were in vet school. We're like, can you help us draw blood on this? Can you show me how? You know, we're, we're ridiculous. Veterinarians may be really cool now when we know what we're doing, but oh lord, it was really fun. So I, you know, we're drawing blood on him, we're getting poop samples, we're running our own tests. You know, I know how to run the heartburn tests, so those techs that were helping me draw blood, I was running the heartburn tests. So we would trade back and forth and we ran fecal tests and he had heartworm disease, he had giardia, he had coccidia, he had roundworms, he was a disaster. <coughs> so we loved him anyway, you know, he's stinky, we're kissing him, we thought he was fantastic. So we treat him for his worms, and then comes the day that we need to treat him for heartworm. Pretty scary stuff, actually. So we're ready to give it, and we, at that point, had caparsalate, was the only treatment we had available, which is a severe liver toxin. There's like a really narrow um, space of healing that you can use with it. Too much? Ooh, not good. Bye-bye, dog. Um, so it was really scary. You know, these are our cases, and we're like, okay, we're going to give it to him. So we give him the caparsalate, and he's like, great, great, mm, where's the food? Can I have some more kisses? Do you want to take me for a walk? You know? <laughs> so we, we worked with him day two. He is bright yellow. He is sick as a dog. He's throwing up, he's miserable. We think he's gonna die, we're running fluids on him. We are just so upset that our poor guts, our poor guts who we loved, three of us on a team, love this dog, please Gus don't die, please Gus don't die, why do you have to heart disease? disease? This is the stupidest disease I've ever seen. And he lived. He totally made it. We nursed him in between appointments, you know, or in between classes. We put him down there, oh my god, are you okay? Do you need something? You need a little bit of my food? Do you want my lunch? You know, we're just, please live, please live. And he lived, and he got home, and we are thrilled. But let me tell you, I never, ever want to treat another case of heartworm again. We have, better, we have better treatments now, better treatments, but they're still scary as all get out. So I am very lucky to be practicing in the state of Oregon right now because, let me just knock on some wood over here. <laughs> I have never seen a case of heartworm disease in my clinic in five and a half years. That's fantastic. I love that, and I never want to see a case. So my goal in practice is to have all of my patients on preventative. Because if they're on preventative, hopefully, there's a little caveat there, but hopefully, I never have to treat a case in one of my own patients. I may have to ultimately treat cases that come in that are new, but God, I love my patients. I don't want to do that. So, this is why I'm here today, to talk to you about this. And there's some really interesting things that I have found, and I made this little handout two-sided because honestly, I'm not a PowerPoint kind of girl and <laughs> I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> I really wanted to, I mean, cute puppy pictures and, and Gus, like I could have found a Gus like Todd to show you and I just couldn't do it. So, but I did make these pretty handouts, so hopefully they're good. I really, because these are really interesting things, right? And they only can be represented in picture. So, the first thing I have is our two, 2013 predicted heartworm prevalence. This is from the CAPC, CAPC um, 
is the count, oh my gosh, what does that stand for? The Council for Animal Parasite, Parasite Council. Oh, there's, there's another. Companion Animal Parasite Council. They're awesome. Um, so this is their predicted heartworm prevalence. And if you look, you know, the really scary areas where we don't want to be is down there, you know, Texas, Florida, that southern area. I'm up until you'll, you see Illinois in there, you know, they're out there too. And then a little bit up north. But we are on there as well, and we're, they're calling us moderate. We're not low or very low. The state of Oregon is moderately predicted for 2013 for heartworm. I don't know what the actual numbers are that came out of there, but I do have some anecdotal information for you. <coughs> The place where we do have information is the heartworm incidence 2010, which is the map below that. And if you look, there is a kind of bright red area in Oregon there at the south, and that's Grants Pass. 26 to 50 cases per clinic. That's a lot. That's a lot of cases of heartworm in the state of Oregon. So that was kind of scary, right? And that's 20. Now, they're reporting a lot of cases out of Eugene. That is not very far away. So I don't have the numbers for you for that, but that's where the scary news is coming in through that channel. Like, oh my god, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. So, it is important. I think it is going to be here. I think about West Nile virus, which is also a mosquito-borne illness. Heartworm is spread by mosquitoes. Not through poop, I have a lot of clients say, I don't need that. My dog doesn't come in contact with other dogs or poop. I'm like, that's great. But it's spread by mosquito. And you do, we do have mosquitoes here, as many of you probably remember from the summertime. Um, so in 2010, that high incident, um, oh, I lost track there. West Nile virus is here. Um, so West Nile virus originally came into the States, what is it, in 1999. It was found first in the US. That was way over in New York and in Pennsylvania. Well, it hit Oregon in 2003. So we were the holdouts. We're like, we don't have it, we don't have it, we don't have a smile. And then it came. So now we get all these reports about it. It's really crummy. But it's also a disease spread by mosquitoes. So I thought about that. I also thought about a very interesting thing that might be um, this kind of a pet theory. Pet theory. <laughs> That's good. Um, is that Hurricane Katrina, which hit in 2005, many of you may have been down there actually to help. We had tons of dogs brought up from Hurricane Katrina, lots and lots through OHS, through many organizations, private organizations. People rescued them and brought them up to find them homes. Well, these dogs have a lot of heartworm, heartworm positive, right? Because even if they were pets originally, if they were on preventative, they weren't on preventative for quite a while before they came out here. So that was a whole big thing as well, to have to treat all those dogs. But they came up, and even the private ones, you had to think, well, maybe they're, and people moving away from their homes and coming up here as well um, could have been bringing heartworm disease with them. The other interesting thing is we have a wild, an urban wild coyote population. Coyotes can be a reservoir for heartworm. And so I found an article in April 2009 which talked about coping with neighborhood coyotes. So, you know, and there are some, I know, I have heard of them being named, like in certain neighborhoods, people know them, they seem running down the street. It's kind of cool that we have them, aside from, you know, the cat thing, um, and the fact that they could be a reservoir for heartworm disease. So. There's just a lot of factors that are kind of bringing things this way. The big thing they saw in California, which if you look at that little you know, kind of valley area on the 2010 incident map, they were tracking that since, um, I think it was 95 that they started really looking at why heartworm was in that area. And the, what they came up with was just all those factors that we're talking about. They didn't have Hurricane Katrina at the time, but they did have decimation of their natural areas and so people were moving in there and they had a lot more mosquito numbers going up and they had the coyotes moving into those urban areas and so it just makes me nervous I don't want to be you know a chicken little sky is falling kind of person but if it is coming 
I want my dog protected for sure. And of course, I'd like everybody else's dog to be protected as well. So then we'll get to the boring part. That's all the exciting scary stuff, right? Um, on the back, you'll see the heartworm life cycle because it's probably pretty important to understand how heartworm is um, spread. Um, that way, the whole coyote thing kind of makes a little more sense. So, you know, it's a circle, so you can kind of start anywhere. But essentially, a mosquito bites a dog, sucks in the larva, and then flies over to take another blood meal on a, you know, flies around for a while, takes another blood meal, infects the dog through its saliva. Then, those little microfilaria, they're really small, they look like threads on a microscope. They, they, they float around, they mature, they get into the tissues, into the lungs, and then they get to be grown-up worms, and they go live in the heart. Now there has to be a couple of them, right? Because they need a boy and a girl to reproduce. So you have the male and female worms hanging out in the heart. This is great, baby worm in the heart. This is awesome, let's make babies. They make a gajillion babies. Those microfilaria start circulating, which is why when a mosquito bites dog, there's so many of them that they can, they'll suck them up and carry them around and give them to another dog. So the problem is, you know, so that's the cycle. They, they molt, there's all these L larval stages, and I'm like, really? You guys don't want to hear that. So I just made, I picked this really cool image. Um, and then of course, no heartworm talk would be complete without the scary heartworm picture, right? So there's a picture of the heart and the worms that live in the right ventricle and go into kind of the pulmonary arteries there. And they're, they're just terrible. I mean, there were real pictures, you know, I'm like really hopeless to do I really want a real picture of a heart? So I liked the representation just to really show you. It's like having spaghetti in your heart. It can cause a lot of problems, dogs. You know, dogs will carry heartworm disease for a long period of time before you know they have a problem, which is why in endemic areas they test every year um, because they can be infected and we want to you want to go ahead and make sure that they get treated or at least treat the microfilaria so they're not spreading it to anybody else. Um, and so, what we want to do really is test, right? Make sure that they don't have heartworm disease and get them on preventative. What we do in our clinic is we have a few different preventatives that we recommend, and we put puppies on it before they're six months old. If you're pre six months old, you don't have to have a heartworm test because it takes that long to become infected and for those adult heartworms to grow. So, you can start treating pre six months if they're a puppy. So we will treat all of our puppies. If they're older than six months old, we do test them for heartworm disease. And we use that fancy cool antigen test that you just, which looks for the adult worms. We send it out to the lab so they don't have any messy centrifuge stuff to deal with. And we use IDEX lab and they also include tick-borne diseases in there as well, which is kind of like an extra plus that we, that we have. Um, our preventatives, there's a, many, many different ones. Obviously, the thing that we're looking for is, yeah, heartworm prevention, but there are a lot that have flea control in them as well, and they also have monthly deworming. Now, that's where my really exciting part comes in, because where we practice in Southeast, there's tons of dog parks. Everybody likes to go to the dog park. It's fantastic, and everybody likes to pick up parasites there, and so I love having a monthly preventative, and that's how we really look at it for our clients is a monthly preventative to prevent intestinal parasites and also gets on wrong. So when that that storm hits, we're gonna be well covered. And you can get that flea control in there too. So that's really kind of where we come from with, with heartworm disease and prevention. There's all <coughs> kinds. There's um, our big ones are Trifaxis. We like the oral products. Um, we don't really like the topicals. So Trifaxis is our big one, and that's got melbomycin in it, um, which is a heartworm preventative and dewormer. And it also has um, medication for adult fleas, spinosin. And then we also use a lot of Sentinel. We really like Sentinel. We live in a very natural-minded area. People like really natural products. And the way that Sentinel works is very similar. It's got the melbomycin for the heartworm and intestinal parasites, but it also has a this is my favorite talk, I'm just going to say, even though we're not talking about fleas, it's got a chitin inhibitor in it called Lufenarin, which is um, also a program, if you guys know that product. And the way that one works is it, 
it prevents chitin, it's a chitin inhibitor, it prevents chitin from forming. Chitin is that really gross outer covering of the bug that we squish through if you happen to squish a bug. Um, and so it's a hard, hard shell. And this is the sad, sad story of how it works in the in for fleas, which we're really glad because we don't want our dog to have fleas. But the way it works is that that flea can still that adult flea gets to live its life. It bites the dog, it does its whole life thing, it lays the eggs. But when that little tiny baby flea forms, that little wormy flea, it usually has a little chitin horn that forms to pip out of the egg. No chitin horn. No pipping out of the egg, so it dies from the egg. Which is so sad, I know, but it's just awesome. <laughs> because it controls all this egg. But basically, that's really sad, but it's fantastic because mammals don't have chitin in them, so it's a really nice, safe product. <coughs> With others, too, Revolution is another one that we, that we use, mainly cats, which is the topical that's absorbed systemically. It does also deworm cats, which is great. Um, and we also use it for some dogs that can't take oral products, don't like oral products, have sensitivities, or it just works nicer for them. So, so that is my sad tale of heartworm. And thank you guys thank so you. much. That was way more time.